Welcome to The Mountain Gardener with your host, Ken Lane. Gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and local advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome your host, Ken Lane. And welcome, welcome, welcome to this week's edition of The Mountain Gardener. The very last uh, edition of January, goodbye the first month of this year. So it just seems like it flew right by. Uh, This week, you notice we had a nor'easter. We didn't. They did. That's the reason we all live here in Arizona, isn't it? You get all that uh, winter weather back east. I mean, the ice storms of the south, the big blizzards of that uh, Great Lakes and then east uh, fashion. So just, uh, gosh, don't you appreciate where we live? Isn't it nice? Uh, we Four seasons, but yet we don't get the harsh weather that other parts of the country do. You might ask, well, then we got four seasons. What is our zone, Ken? And, and when does the last frost date? When's the first frost date? What are, what are some basic specs of the Central Highlands or let's just say northern Arizona, the mountains, the high country. Once you come up from Phoenix, uh, up that hill through Black Canyon City and, and, and raise up to God's country, we definitely change change zones. I mean, down you folks down in the Cottonwood, Camp Verde, uh, Jerome, those areas, you're probably a zone seven. Zone eight, you could flirt with that. So definitely strong zone seven. So you've got plants that can go down to about 10 degrees. Something like that. Uh, You folks in the Cordes Junction to, I would say, Prescott Valley Corridor, that that 69 corridor. And I would probably include Kingman. Hmm. I'd say up to about 5,000, maybe 5,200 foot level. You folks are going to be a zone seven again to zone six some years. And this is mainly your zone seven, but some years it gets really cold. And so generally you'll need plants to go down to 10, but about once every 10 years, you folks will go down to minus, you know, down to about zero degrees, which that's a zone six plant. And so you kind of want to look for zone six, and this is USDA rating, the national rating scale. So when you look at a plant tag, it'll say, oh, this is a Colorado spruce zone three. That is, the Colorado spruce is like crazy man cold. It's from the very high altitudes. It'll go down to like minus 20 degrees. It might even be minus 40. Some really bitter cold. Now, a zone three plant can also grow in a zone four, five, six, seven. After you get up to about eight, it starts to get too warm. They need some cold to keep them healthy. So a Colorado spruce will not grow in Wickenburg won't grow in Yuma, won't grow in Phoenix or Tucson. It has to have the chilling. It has to have that cold winter. So you need to have some cold, but going down to zero degrees, a zone three Colorado spruce that can survive all the way down to very much negative 20, 30, 40 degrees in temperature. It can also though grow in zero degrees or 10 degrees or 20 degrees, but it needs some freezing. It needs that freeze thaw to keep healthy. And so that's why they're explaining those zones to you. You folks up in the Flagstaff area, you guys are cold. So you're zone four or five. I mean, you're, you're definitely a click colder. You need things that can go down to minus 10, minus 20 degrees. Kind of depends on, on the hilltops. The hilltops are actually warmer in the mountains than the then the drafty lowlands, so all that cold air spills out off of the Ash Fork, spills down that hill towards Paulden and Chino Valley, and you folks get the coldest of the cold and the hottest of the hot because all that cold air just settles right down on top of you. And you'll see that. that will be kind of foggy in those areas, just temperature inversions. Things happen. So you got to look at your area. And where you're at and where your home is positioned, north, south, east, or west. The south face side of a hill is a zone warmer than the north side of that same hill. The neighborhood takes up the entire ridge line or mountain line, but your neighbors on the north side will be a zone colder than the neighbors on the south side. 
We call those microclimates. In the mountains, there's a lot of different microclimates. And so in, in my own personal gardens, this is a half acre lot. It's not huge. It's not a ranch like some of you live on. It's not a ranchette. It's not a big mansion. It's just a regular old middle of the road house, half acre. That it's, it is on a north slope overlooking parts of Prescott, the Granite Dells area. And uh, down there, below the deck, it's a two-story house. And so it's a classic dug into the side of the hill. The, you got to drive down the driveway to get into the garage. And then you step down a couple staircases to get to the backyard. It's, it's a classic mountain home. In the front yard, Zone 7. Beautiful. I mean, this is Prescott at 56, 5,700 foot. It's up there a ways. Not as up there as you folks in Williams or Flagstaff, you know, those Highland Pines. But, you know, it's not lowland either, like the folks in Cottonwood, Camp Verde, those areas. Uh, it it's, it's, can get cold. The north side, though, because it's the, my house, the sun hits that front patio, which has some brick. It's got some patios on it. It's got a little water feature. It's got raised beds. The sun warms up all that. The house warms up the patio. And it warms up that that groin area. The backyard, though, a definite zone colder. Plants that thrive in the front yard freeze out in the backyard. And so the, the pansies in the backyard, they're limping along. They look so cold. They hardly see the sun. It's north side, two-story house. They're just cold. The ice stays there. The snow stays there. On the front side of the house, it melts right away. Pansies look fabulous. The kale looks great. Uh, just a totally different zone in the same yard. You'll see that in your own yard as well. We're into uh, planting season, especially the dormant stuff. So it's time. This is a, it's time. It's, we're into February. You're starting to run out of time to plant dormant fruit trees. It's time to put fruit trees in. You know, dormant, I would say shade trees. Any of your dormant stuff, lilac. Forsythia, all that stuff that's without, it's deciduous. It doesn't have foliage. You want to get those ideally in the ground before they wake up, before they bloom, before they leaf. And so especially fruit trees. If you want fruit this year, you need to get them in the ground before they leaf out and before they set fruit. This is, this is important. And you want to plant a fruit tree. That is of fruiting age. If you, uh, tr fruit trees, how do I explain that? Fruit trees need to be about seven years old before they'll start to set fruit. When they're younger, they look like a tree. They just aren't mature enough to set a fruit. So you want a tree that is old enough that to set, tr to set fruit. It's mature enough. Then you want to put it in the ground before it wakes up. If you do that, it is highly likely you'll have fruit this season. If you don't do that, you'll probably not get fruit this year. It'll be next year before you get it. Okay. So that, that's why you, there's some reasons why you want to put plants, plants in at certain times of the year. Zones zone. That's, that's our zone. I explained our zones Prescott. You, and, uh, I would really say the central, the, the tri city or quad city areas, really you're okay. You're, you're golden. If you go zone six, you could definitely flirt very strongly with zone seven. You are not a zone eight. I don't care which Google thing you go on to. If those, we get too cold too often. And so zone six will take you out down to six single digits and still the plants are alive. They'll take you all the way to about zero degrees and the plants will still come out of it alive, healthy, well. If you go to zone eight stuff, boy. About every five years, they're going to be killed out. I mean, you, they'll, it'll grow for a year or two, and then it'll get zipped by a winter. Oh, gosh, we've got a couple months left of frost. I think we're coming out of the coldest of the cold, but uh, typically February, it starts to turn in northern Arizona and gets pretty nice. March, it's beautiful, uh, but they're still frosty. Let me go over the frost dates. What is, when is the last frost date? the different elevations. But first, let's get to Lisa Waters Lane in the studio, get to your questions. We'll be right back with this and more. You've been listening to The Mountain Gardener with Ken Lane, owner of Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Join him every week for timely garden advice right for the gardens. 
Visit Ken where he can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Hi, Ken here with the Plants of the Week and our Arizona Cypress. If you want low-maintenance natives, easy care, and reduced water use, then this is the evergreen for you. When planted in rows, they block the wind, traffic noise, and make the perfect privacy screen, all for under 40 bucks. Comes in an Arizona blue, easy to grow, and prefers monsoon planting. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love native evergreens, they love to shop. My living room feels so empty. Now that the Christmas tree is gone, the house just seems so blah. Brighten it up with a big, bold, beautiful plant from Waters Garden Center. Fill that cavernous space with tall tropicals, colossal cactus, and sizable succulents that bring the great outdoors indoors. Make a gorgeous green space you can enjoy all year, not just for a season. Unique, exclusive, one-of-a-kind houseplants found only at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. You've been listening to Ken Lane, the Mountain Gardener. Green thumbs learned while working in the Family Garden Center. Now welcome back to the Mountain Gardener. Okay, so we are back with Lisa Waters Lane in the studio. She comes each week with your garden questions. Just what are your neighbors talking about? And sometimes you can pick up and learn things like that. So welcome to the studio, Lisa. Thank you. So you've been staying warm? Yeah. <laughs> it's got cold today. It's The I mornings are cold. cold. Yeah. The afternoons are, are beautiful. And then it gets cold again. <laughs> you've been out. You are a pea vine walker. You're constellation out there. Trail. Or constellation. I'm sorry. Yep. Yeah. Constellation. The, mm-hmm. the, the dells, basically. Right. And so you're out there. What's that like? Is it wet, cold, snowy, dogs it's everywhere, cold. coyotes, bears, <laughs> mountains? Lime? It's definitely cold. I'm amazed how much water is still in the little creeks and little pockets around there, frozen, of course. Yeah. Uh, but still a lot of water floating around out there, which is good. It's a good thing. You want that. This is a walker's paradise. Mm-hmm. Hiker, mountain biker, outdoors, Outdoor forest, paradise. Mm-hmm. It truly is. It's good. And you take advantage of it. You get friends you kind of oh, meet yeah. out there. So if you see little, little snows are out there walking in a, in a big black uh, Labrador retriever. That's Lisa. Just say, hi, Lisa. I have to say, we're usually the first and only people on the trail really? early in the morning. It'll warm up. It'll get better. Oh, yeah. It will. So what are some garden questions that people are talking about that maybe can accentuate their hiking experience here on the show? <laughs> so we or do not. have questions, but I also want to just uh, put in a little plug. I was just talking to some uh, guests out in the nursery yard, and they were saying they're kind of fairly new to the area. I think they've been here two or three years. They have a big piece of property that they're putting stuff on and and loving it yeah Uh, but she just said to me and i thought this is really cool she goes i am so thankful for you guys and your website and the informational the youtubes the facebook she goes i have learned so that's encouraging yeah we put a lot of energy into it that's I know. It was really nice it was very nice to hear but it also if you're new to the area watersgardencenter.com. It is a huge resource for you. You should take advantage of it because there is so much on there that's just free informational material. Yeah, we should charge for that. Now that you <laughs> talk about it. it is an encyclopedia because there's yeah. no real garden content f- for this area. There's lots of Phoenix Desert stuff. Right. Right. There's lots of East Coast Chicago, you know, DC, Boston, New York, over to uh, uh, Chicago. Mm-hmm. Lots of info there. There's nothing for this high altitude. I mean, Denver a little bit, right. but we've got much alkaline, more alkaline soil. We've got more wind, quite honestly, especially on the ridge lines. It's a different climate. So we're going, what can we do? Right. Sunset Garden Book used to be the go-to, but it really didn't do us justice. It was more mm-hmm. California-based. Right. So we just started doing these podcasts and radio shows and garden columns. I just checked on our uh, our website. We have over thirty thousand backlinks embedded in the in the garden columns. That mm-hmm. is, if you're mentioning a a plant and it tickles your fancy, we put a link in there on how to go find it, how to buy it, where to buy it from. Uh, we we jump out to other growers. Mm-hmm. You know, if we did a video at it where we're touring to growers, we'll put that YouTube in there. We embed it. So we found some funky, weird 
aphids are taking over. We'll take a picture and embed that. And so we're trying to make it interactive, mm -hmm. digital. It's not just a still website that you expect oh, from, no. from most mom and pop yeah. organizations. It's, it's actually yeah. real. Mm -hmm. And it's not just copied Google stuff that confuses the living daylights <laughs> out of you. I was helping a client uh, in the houseplants. Mm -hmm. She was doing some houseplant stuff. And she's got an apartment. forget where. She was, I was trying to do some research. And I was dumbfounded. I didn't even know. There's so many recommendations. I didn't know where to go. Yeah. Then I saw your website. Mm -hmm. And so they, she came in for that. So mm -hmm. it's kind of a, yeah, it's a marketing tool, but really cool. we just want you to be successful. Yeah. That's our, that's yeah. our marketing tool is mm -hmm. your success. If you're successful and you, we helped you, you'll, that's word of mouth in a small town. You'll, mm -hmm. you'll let your neighbors know. And that's right. worked for us for 60 years, mm -hmm. 59 years. Ooh. And 10 months because it, it March 11th, we turn, we have our 60th spring open house. Very excited cool. about that. Yeah. yeah. Very nice. So, but anyways, just want to put that little plug out there for, for the newer people, but Tom and Chino would like to know is now the time to be putting out his pre-emergent. Oh yeah. That wind out there, the tumbleweeds get so <laughs> big. They, and they roll over the fences, Paulden, and it just that windows, windy yeah. valleys, uh, absolutely. In fact, January is your month. You're already seeing dandelions and the first of the, uh, I've, I've seen uh, feather, feather grass, foxtail. uh, foxtails are already starting. Right. So really you want to get it down. ASAP. Like, yeah, like three weeks ago before this last storm, but mm -hmm. now go, go for it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now's better. And so, and then keep up with the weeds. So you put you pre pre-emergent down, you spread it in your yard. For you folks that don't know, or you're from the Midwest, you're just not used to mm -hmm. pre-emergence. We don't have lawnmowers here. We have <laughs> pre-emergent. So we've got rock lawns. And so we don't really have a lot of grass. And so we're putting this fertilizer type uh, material, a, a granular material, you spread it around in your hand spreader and you put it over the rock, down the driveways, down the fence lines. And as the rain and snow hit this fertilizer, it goes into the soil. It keeps the seed from germinating. So there's, there's forget how many seed, there's hundreds yeah. per square inch yeah, of crazy. seed in your yard. It's a, there's got science on this and it's waiting for the perfect environment to come up. And so this keep puts a band or a barrier down there that doesn't allow the weeds. You put it down now, January, I recommend truly uh, out there, especially in Chino, put it down again the end of June, first part of July, mm -hmm. right before the rainy season comes. We've got this monsoon pattern that happens in the middle of the summer. Right. I put it down right before that, and that'll keep your whorehound, the goat head, and the tumbleweeds from coming up. So we've got two different kinds of crops, mm -hmm. winter weeds, which are now, and then we've got our, our summer weeds. <laughs> you put it down twice. You're not going to be weeding, and, right. and you don't need to put that cancerous roundup out there. You could just you just won't have weeds, or it's so reduced that yeah. it saves you, my you hands. a lot of oh, labor yeah. and a lot of time oh, oh to do gosh. that. Word of caution: if you're putting out uh, wildflower seed or you're thinking of grass seed in an area, do not use pre-emergent yeah. <laughs> in those areas because it doesn't know the difference between a weed and a flower. Yeah. So just keep just be aware of, yeah. of that. Don't put it down over your lawn lawn seed. You can put it down on a lawn yeah. that's already coming up. It'll keep the daily right. from coming up, but don't put it down on a new, of course, it's too early for lawns. Although it's not too early for wild grasses. Right. Put that down now. Wild mm -hmm. seed, yeah. wild grass and wildflower seeds you put down now. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's good advice. Yeah. yeah. Glad you mentioned that. <laughs> Just a word of warning. Yeah. All right. Next question is from Lori. It's her first spring here in the Prescott Valley area. Welcome, Lori. And she would like to know, are there any veggies that she can put in this time of year? Oh, there are. It's limited. There's a few. We've got a few out there. A few herbs you can put mm -hmm. out now. So they're, they're winter types of plants. And so kale, uh, you've been harvesting that all winter mm -hmm. long. Those of you that have those leafy types of, of material. So lettuce. Uh, uh, broccoli, cauliflower, all these things can go in as soon as the ground, as soon as there's not ice in the ground, mm -hmm. you can start planting those. So Pretty right similar. now we're encouraging them to prepare your soils because mm -hmm. by March 1, you are full on planting your garlics and onions. I mean, full on all that winter blooming stuff, not yeah. tomatoes, not, not, yet. not cucumbers, not, not the things you're harvesting the fruit, but you're definitely putting in all your other leafy things. So mm -hmm. yeah, there's a few things in the containers. Our yeah. kale looks 
gorgeous, uh, yeah, full bloom, just beautiful. I think on the website, we have a vegetable calendar, don't we? We do, yeah. So that would be really good information for people new in the area as far as what you can plant when. There's a, a, anytime we host a garden class, every Saturday we have a garden class. And then when we have a handout that we've created for that class, whether it's irrigation or, or wildflowers or vegetables, we create a handout and we put it on the website. And if you go to watersgardencenter.com and the upper up in the very band at the very top, you'll see learn, L-E-A-R-N, learn button. Learn. All the handouts. <laughs> we have, I got to come up with something out of you. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> put these websites together. You're going, I don't know how it would make sense. Uh, learn. And it's all the handouts are all PDFs. Mm -hmm. So you can open them up on any kind of device, your, mm -hmm. your, your phone, your tablets, your, your, any kind of your desktop, laptop. It's there. So anyone can open it and just look for, well, any of those things. Yeah, There's a ton. How many are on there? Like 30 Three dozen. I don't know. There's so, a lot. Yeah. Anything so. you want to know. Not but anything, yeah. but a lot of <laughs> the most important things, at least taught in a, in a yeah. garden class. Okay, Ken and Lisa Lane, we are out of time. Ten minutes, just like that. We'll be right back after these important messages. You're listening to Ken Lane, a.k.a. The Mountain Gardener. Ken can be found throughout the week in Prescott at Waters Garden Center. Listen each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to mountain gardens. Gardening and you don't know where to start? Waters In-Home Garden Service comes to you and identifies what you have and how to make it better. Design advice, water strategies, vegetable and flower gardens, soil and food needs, and problem solving. Always problem solving. You'll instantly be a better gardener. All for just $200 of expert time with a coupon to fill your garden dreams without ever leaving home. In-Home Garden Consultations from Waters Garden Center. We can be at your home this week. Hi, Lisa with the Plants of the Week and our Goshiki Holly. Goshiki translates from Japanese as holly with five colors. Its new leaves emerge red, then turn green. The entire top of this holly is draped in colors of cream, white, gray, yellow, and green. This evergreen makes the perfect accent, hedge, or evergreen container for its all-round good looks. A really nice plant that shines through winter is just $39. Waters Garden Center, where people who love Japanese gardens, they love to shop. You've been listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Join the conversation every week as he answers timely garden questions. Email Ken a question directly from your phone to his desktop through the web at watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Now welcome back your host, Ken Lane. If there was ever a time that you wanted to, to play with wildflowers. This is your absolute ideal window. In fact, it looks like we've got some weather coming in the next week or so. So snow. Wildflowers need this freeze and thaw cycle to really perform well, especially those seed that have a real hard outer husk or shell uh, they, uh, casing like, like on California poppies. They need that freeze and thaw to crack open so the seed can actually get through that outer shell. If it doesn't see that, it just sits there and rots or becomes bird food. And so timing with, with wildflowers is absolutely critical. That and there is no mythical solution for this. You can't just take a handful of seed, chuck it over your hillside, and watch the wildflowers grow up. It doesn't work that way. Nature can make that happen. You see whole hillsides turning red with Indian paintbrush or gallardias. Here, yeah, nature has millions of seed that it does it, that it throws out there and, you know, 2% actually come up of all those seed. You don't want to waste or have that kind of, you, you want a hundred percent or up in the, well, you know, good 90% uh, germination rate. And so there you do want to nurture and prepare the soil a bit. Now, it's not like gardening for a vegetable or flower bed. It's not that kind of prep. But you do want to rock away, you know, rake away the rocks, the debris, the weeds that will choke out. You want to prepare and have little pockets of wildflowers come up that, that hillside that you want to help retain the moisture or that meadow that you want to see more flowers coming up through the grasses. You want to think that through and, and prepare it. Here's how you really do it. First of all, let's go timing. Now's the time. Mid-winter 
to very early spring is when you want to put them in. So now through by the very latest end of March, really, you, really, you do want to put that seed down and have some some winter weather hit those seed. It'll help it get into the soil. It'll help it scarify or open up that, that seed hull. It'll help your germ- germination rate. And then they'll come up. They'll cycle through our natural cycle. And when all the other uh, echinaceas come up, all the other lupins, the co- columbines come up. And so timing now is, is your best time. So I'd say now between now through the end of February would be your peak best window. But um, anyway, that, that's, that's your window. Got it. And that's, you know why. The seed varieties. Watch this one very carefully. This is where our industry, and I'm talking as a global representative of gardening supplies and seed and soils. This is where our industry takes a lot of shortcuts. This is where the glitz and glamour does not help you. They'll take a seed mix that's mainly annual-based. Remember, there's annuals and perennials. Annuals come up by seed very quickly and bloom right away, and then they die and don't come back again. They might reseed a little bit, but really what you're looking for in a perennial wildflower bed is you want perennials. You want those things that come up, they seed, then they'll come up again next year by the same seed, by the same root. So look for perennial seeds. Okay, how do I do that, Ken? Well, you just have to talk to an expert or do some research on it. We, we can walk you through here at the nursery and tell you which ones are better than the others. Uh, but they'll, they'll Frequently, the lesser expensive seed mixes or the glitzy, the one with the real glossy uh, metallic bags with pretty pictures on the front, Those many times those are annuals. Annuals are cheaper to use. They're less expensive because they produce heavier. They're just less expensive. So they'll use them as that. And then they'll fill up the rest of the bag with vermiculite. So if it's a large bag, few people can afford a large, large bag of wildflower seed. They're just more expensive than a regular, let's say, lawn seed or something. So do your homework uh, and research perennial annuals. And then make sure it's pure seed, not a, not filled with a lot of different vermiculites or, or filler kind of stuff. That'll really help you. Then you go ahead and just rake up that part of the yard where you want wildflowers. So you open up the earth so it'll receive it and it gets rid of the rocks. And you sprinkle your seed over that area and it magically will come up next spring. For myself, here's the insider tip. Here's what I do personally. I will buy a bag of mulch. We've got a premium mulch that we screen down real, real fine. I'll put it in a wheelbarrow. I'll put my wildflowers into the, into the mulch and I'll blend this up together. So I create this, my own personal hydro mulch for two reasons. One, it makes it easier so I can see where this stuff is being spread. They say like an, an ounce of seed goes like 500 feet. There's no way you can spread the seed that thin. Well, it helps me spread it thinner without burying the seed. And then most of these seeds only want to be buried maybe, I mean, a quarter inch, just barely underneath the soil, which is also where the bird like to peck around. So the mulch helps keep it hydrated, helps me visually spot where to put it. Then it keeps the birds off of my wildflower seed. After I've put that out there, I'll water it in real good. And then I'll just wait for spring to happen. There's not a lot of maintenance. If it's in a really bone dry, sunny area, I might water it once a month or a couple weeks or so. I'll monitor it a little bit, but you'll be prone to overwater your wildflower seeds, not underwater. So don't overdo it. Don't treat it like your regular annual beds out there in the yard. And that's how you put in a wildflower bed. I do have a handout on that. It's free. It's a two page sheet. It tells you how to go through all the details. It's come in and get a copy. It's there to help you with your wildflowers. Better yet, I tell you what, I'll put this at the top of my blog post. Uh, let's see, on Monday, I'll have my assistant put put uh, how to put wildflowers down. It'll be at uh, watersgardencenter.com. On the left-hand side, you'll see a blog post. We'll just put it towards the top part of that feed. And you can download it from there as well. Or I'll have a printed copy right here at Waters Garden Center. Come in and say hi and get a copy of that. Be right back. The Mountain Gardener, your source for timely garden advice right for higher elevations. Guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Let's talk poop. Hey, I'm Tommy at Waters Garden Center. Ken and Lisa are out right now, so I snuck in to remind you that it's time to add some manure to your garden. It's been a wet winter, and your soil is, well, pooped. 
Waters Barnyard Manure adds nutrients to get your garden growing. It's organic and odorless, so we really can say our poop don't stink. Buy six bags or more. They're only $5.99. Now that's a load of crap. Tommy, what's going on? Oh, poop, gotta go. Natural, safe, odorless, and organic at Waters Garden Center. Hi, Elisa with the Plants of the Week and our Austrian Pine. We have instantaneous trees just in and ready for planting. This pine has the same long needles as our Ponderosa pine without all the problems. And these trees are really big and bold. This is the fastest growing at the pines and lots of sizes to choose from. But the $249 model is exceptionally big. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. For people who love big, bold pines, they love to shop. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert, Ken Lane. Mountain gardening is very rewarding. With a few of Ken's tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts, sure to turn your thumbs even greener. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. All right, we are back with Lisa Waters Lane in the studio. She comes with uh, just sharing her take on gardening. Uh, throughout the week so she comes in each week and you, we've been doing this for how long my dear <laughs> i don't know it's been 10 15 20 years i that can't long? remember nah. okay so long neither one of us can remember <laughs> how long we've been doing this <laughs> either we're just getting old and can't remember or it's just it's just so time fun. flies a seasonality just comes and goes and it, it is kind of nice to have january where you get a little break um there's a little bit of gardening actually doing more remodeling inside in the paddock and extend the patio, the driveway, going to mm-hmm. level out drive uh, patios in the backyard, um, cleaning the barbecue grill, the simple things <laughs> that you normally don't do when you're right. out there all the time. So you can catch up on things. Mm-hmm. It's been pretty nice out. It has been. Yeah. A little bit of cold, but then it warmed right back up. I'm seeing bees are out. So yeah. honeybees have been flying around. So that means mm-hmm. they're warm enough to at least venture out during the day right i saw some moths flying around really yep out in the front yard so i don't know what they were doing and what kind they were just tiny little things fluttering around so things are kind of starting to wake up (laughs) the buds on some of the the lilacs yeah they're looking big yeah so you can tell springs right around the corner you can kind of when i go out hiking and stuff you can see the buds starting to set on the trees and then some of the trees that wake up really early starting to get a bit of a green cast oh all you gardeners you're always looking for green (laughs) it's a month it's a month away you're looking you already see it so that's that's hope that is hope that's That's what gardeners do that is right i mean gardens are the ultimate optimists that's true otherwise why would you look at a seed catalog and order (laughs) you know pay two bucks for you know 10 tiny seeds that will be will look like that package you know five months from now (laughs) So anyway, what do you got for us this week? What's going on? Sure. So still have a lot of people moving into the area, new homes going in. Uh, So we do get a lot of people asking about screens. They want to screen their neighbors, screen the roads, screen, you know, the ugly RV garage out there. Um, And and yes, you can plant now and and get those those screens started so that you'll get those plants in the ground so that when they wake up, they're going to get some more growth on them and you'll even have a better screen. So it's a good time to be putting those things in. And as long as you can dig in the soil here, you can plant. And there's a lot of nice evergreen type screens that you can use. So I thought I'd talk about a few of those. Evergreen screens that provide winter long dense privacy. (laughs) Google will like that search. (laughs) There you go. So just a couple of things to think about when you're you're thinking screens, you know, obviously how long is the length of what you're trying to screen out? If it's a really long length, um, I always tell people don't put one, you know, don't plant 50 of one tree. Monoculture. Right. That's you what they call that. Yeah. yeah. You need some diversity yeah. in there. Um, number one, it adds interest to the eye. So it's not just little soldiers lined up ready to march on your house. Um, But also if a disease or an insect comes through that wipes out a certain variety, um, you have a backup. You know, you don't have 50 of one tree that can just 
totally wipe out your whole screen. Leland Cypress. I think mm -hmm. you're mentioning those. That's a, we sold that for decades. Right. We thought, oh, bulletproof, nice green, thick, 25 feet by 12 feet wide. Mm -hmm. Perfect screen. We're losing every single one of them in the yeah. county. There's not one. It's, it's, they've been attacked for about five years now, and mm -hmm. there's hardly one left because yeah. uh, there's a there's a canker, some weird disease that gets in the base, cuts them out, and then doesn't get on the other cypress, no. only Leland's. Yeah. And so if you had a monoculture all the way down the driveway, they're all going to die. You can just watch them. There's nothing you can do. Right. We if, if we would we, we could have sent our kids to college <laughs> at a nicer school, but no, we have, we think if we'd had figured out yeah. how to solve that, but right. there's no cure for mm -hmm. that. It's terrible. So it it's is terrible. something to just really be aware of too. Yeah. And the other thing for screens, especially if you're screening for a sound, uh, it's good to have some, some variation in there and don't line them all just up in a row, Yeah, kind of off center them or stagger them uh, using some other shrubs. Yeah. Or you know, things in between it adds interest and it also helps with the sound if you're trying to create a sound barrier as different well. textures and heights mm -hmm. affect that sound wave more right. than just having one type of texture, one type of foliage, one type. Mm -hmm. I would say, I even tell folks when I'm helping them, put some deciduous stuffs in there, sure. put a put a maple, put an aspen, put a yeah. put some crab apples, something that grows fast mm -hmm. while you're waiting for the evergreens to fill in, and then it also gives you some interest. Right. I agree. Definitely. Um, and then also just know your space that you're trying to fill because that way we can get you the correct amount of trees and shrubs to go in there. Uh, the other thing is the height. How tall do you need it to be? Maybe you don't need a 30 foot height. Maybe you need a 10 foot height or a 15 foot height. But the, those are questions we're going to kind of ask you when you come in looking. We're going to say, well, how tall? How wide? So those are things to know ahead of time. Also, um, know how you're going to water them. Are you going to have them on a drip system? Are you going to water by hand? Um, because these are, are living things. You can't just plant them yeah. and go, now live, because they're not going to. They have to be watered. They have to be fed and taken care of. Um, but hugely important to your yard if you're trying to block something. Um, so those are the things to be aware of. If you don't have water out there, you know, go with a really drought hardy, like an Arizona cypress. Um, you know, so those are things that are going to make a huge difference for you and how that screen performs out there. I tell folks too, take a picture. Mm. It just, I mean, pictures don't tell you the distance, Right. but I'm trying to screen this barn. My neighbors just put up, uh, it's on my back patio. It's across the Valley or whatever. I don't want to see them go. Okay. We can do that. Hey, let's play. Let's put one of these great big things, mm -hmm. some smaller things over here. Yeah. So it helps us to visualize what mm -hmm. you're trying to accomplish. Then just pace it off. Quick napkin sketch. Go, no, yeah. it's 50 feet. Right. It's a whole backyard. I want to let's just screen it all. Mm -hmm. but okay, let's let's start. Yeah. Yeah. So those are good things, knowledge to have before you come in. And then I thought just we'd talk about some of those screens that we currently have in that would okay. do perfect. That you can right plan here. now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely. Absolutely. So the the big daddy of them all, I always call it the big daddy, is the Austrian pine. Okay. Uh, because it's a big daddy. <laughs> it gets probably what 30. 35 feet tall yeah, right. and a good 15 to 20, if not even bigger width to it. So a couple of those are going to give you a really good screen or a good base to start with. And then, like you said, put in some other trees and shrubs around it to give it a better look. So ever the Austrian pines are very fast growing, uh, probably what, two feet? Yeah, year? it's probably real. If they're happy, they're 18, happy. 24 inches, pretty, right. pretty realistic. Yeah. So a pretty fast growing tree, nice evergreen, performs wonderfully here in this area. Um, we also have, you know, I was trying to think of the big ones. We also have Arizona cypress would be another big, big one that we do carry. It gets probably, they're getting 30 feet tall or so, and probably yeah. what, 10, 15 feet wide? Yeah, 10, 12, something 10, like 12. that. Yeah, they're pretty, pretty chubby. Yeah. <laughs> Well, they're not as they're not a big chubby. daddy, but they're a chubby daddy, yeah. <laughs> and that's another one, very drought hardy. Yeah. Uh, you know, let them get some age to them, and sometimes you could probably almost take them off water, just knowing if we have droughts, that kind of thing, that you would need to get water yeah. to them. Uh, but that's another good one. And then we have some of the smaller ones out there: the junipers, the Spartan juniper in the Wichita blue juniper. Uh, Spartans are green. And the Wichita blue, of course, is that gray blue color. And I love the contrast of using some of the gray blue, like the Wichita with a with a pine that's green. It gives you a nice contrast oh, yeah. out there. Oh, yeah, that's pretty. 
Mm-hmm. And those, those get, get tall. They're 10, 12, 15 oh, feet yeah. tall. They get, they're not short. No, no, no. They get way above head height. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And they spread, what, five, three to five feet? Yeah, as wide as your hand, maybe a little bit wider. Depends on the your age. Hand? Yeah. And, well, arms. <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> I'm going, that's not very big. Ours are wider than I can, I can't yeah. reach around them. So they're probably so, seven, eight feet wide. Right. And those have been in the ground, what, 10 years? Yeah, something now? like that. They're pretty fully grown. Yeah, they're and they, 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 we Full use them screen. to block the street and actually does a wonderful, wonderful job at mm-hmm. that. Uh, there's a blue point juniper that gets to be about the same height, but it does get wider. So it gets about eight feet yeah. wide. Yep. So it's another one to good mix in there. And I see I'm running out of time. Uh, so I'll just list them off. Hollywood juniper, Arizona cypress, Deodor cedar. Um, all those are nice evergreens. And then fatinias, cotoneasters are more leafy ones that you can also mix in as well. Lots of evergreens you can plant now. It's worthwhile coming in Mm -hmm. to take a look and kind of take them all in and see what they look like. Mix and match. The aisles Mm -hmm. here at the Garden Center have designed more privacy screens. We just take up the aisle and go, let's line them out for Mm -hmm. you. And then so you get the right amount. So you get the right privacy. Lisa Waters laying in with the privacy screens, the, the evergreens you can plant in your yard right now. Be right back after this. Look for more tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts through Ken's website. Podcast the show, read his weekly garden column, or follow him on Facebook and Instagram at watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Once upon a time, Fred the Sage and Bob the Yucca watched a herd of deer eat their neighbor's garden. Hey, Bob, said Fred. It's a good thing we're native Arizona plants from Waters Garden Center. Right, Fred, said Bob. We can handle tough Prescott dirt, hot sun, low water, and we look great in the garden. You betcha, Bob, said Fred. Hummingbirds and bees love us, but that deer sure doesn't. Be like Fred and Bob. Go native at Waters Garden Center. Safe, natural, and organic. Did you know that plants can help you sleep better, naturally? At Waters Garden Center, we have beautiful houseplants that not only look great, they clean the air we breathe. Get this, some plants can actually produce oxygen at night and even take mold spores out of the air, making for less tossing and turning and more beauty sleep. Don't lose sleep, rise and shine with unique, gorgeous houseplants for your best rest yet at Waters Garden Center. Sweet dreams! Welcome to the Mountain Gardener with Ken Lane. Gardening in the mountains is different. Listen to Ken's tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts guaranteed to make your gardens more beautiful than ever this year. Now for better advice that works locally, welcome your host, Ken Lane. Now, let me see if I can cover this in 10 minutes or less. Now, I have a, last year I taught an entire class on how to create raised beds. But I think I can give you a synopsis very quickly. Some of you had such terrible soil. Oh, I feel for you. And I'm I'm with you in that boat. I mean, terrible soil. Uh, Classic dugout hillside. Our hill, it's very steep. And the soil is heavy clay. And it's on the north side. So it's heavy clay and it doesn't drain. And so I tend to kill. I love planting natives. We're kind of famous for for our native plants and all the, all, we grow a lot of them here, here locally. Uh, I, I love manzanita. It's one of my favorites. I have killed five out of five manzanitas in my backyard. I'm growing these babies. I bring them out there. I put them in my own yard and they die. Now that's almost <laughs> insult to injury, but my soil is just such a heavy clay soil. It does not perk. And so manzanita do not like that kind of soil. They like granity soil, very fast draining, sandy kind of soils. And so for my yard, I can't grow that. I mean, it's just not, it's not going to work or, you know, I'm a, now my friends, I'll tell you, use Ken's two strikes and you're out theory. Try planting something once. If it dies, replace it, do it again. Uh, if it dies again, don't, don't torture yourself. I mean, I've tried it five times. My goodness. In fact, I usually tell folks if that variety died, plant in the same place, but change it up and plant something different. So if you lost a lilac, put a forsythian. If you lost a pine tree, put a spruce in, put something different just to take that variable out of the equation, you know, change up the variety. 
Well, here I am. I, I don't cheat. Do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> but that's gardeners. Gardeners want to try it. They want to test the limits and see if they can figure out why. Is there a way to modify the environment and make it grow? And that's just, you know, gardeners, you relate to that, right? Uh, there's just some of that. But raised beds, I've gone with a lot of raised beds because I cannot garden in that soil. I've got a few trees in there, uh, but most everything is in raised beds. And what I did, because it's such a slope, I went down to uh, Yavapai Block. They're the local manufacturer of block, and they've got a little bit bigger uh, block piece than, let's say, your your box stores do. And it's local. It's made. I mean, I'm supporting a friend. It keeps a business here. There's a lot of reasons to go local, but it's a better product, too. So I went down to American, or Yavapai Block, excuse me, and got their pre-made, prefabbed, engineered retaining block. And I put at the low end of the hill. Then I backfilled behind that with Mike Waters potting soil. And everything I put in that bed just thrives. I mean, perennials are gorgeous repeat bloomers. Annuals spill out over the containers. My, my veggies just go crazy. I had pumpkins in the raised beds last year, People came back and said, this looks like Jurassic Park. It looks, they're, they're going crazy. They're, they spilled out out of the beds and down around the beds, and it was magnificent. But that's kind of how I did it. Put it at the low end um, and then backfilled behind it. For some of you, you've got actually flat soil. That's even better. For there, uh, you, the minimum size for a raised bed, I think, there's, not, there's nothing in the book really on this, but three by six. Four by eight is standard but the minimum size I would go with is three foot by six foot. And then what that is, it, it allows you to plant your tomatoes, your bigger uh, sages, your bigger plants, yet it, it's small enough where you can get into both sides of the bed. I like to have my beds at least a foot tall to, to two foot tall. I find that eight inches is just not quite big enough, especially if you're into vegetables like tomatoes, uh, p- potatoes, your bigger rooted things, they need more soil than just eight inches. So about a foot to, to two, 24 inches, somewhere in there, seems to be about right. If you're doing lots of beds in between rows, so I've, I've set up quite a few community gardens. I like to see at least 18 inches between the beds so you can walk in between them. I would say if you're going to take a wheelbarrow down, which is kind of nice, if you got the room, go 24 inches. Typically, you can get a wheelbarrow or a wagon down a two-foot path. Uh, and that, that's kind of their dimensions. Minimum three foot by six foot, and then leave about a foot tall and leave about a foot and a half between each bed. Those will be good dimensions that you, you'll be happy with uh, long-term wise. Uh, again, standard seems to be four foot by eight foot. That's a good, good size. You can still reach in, get to things, and, and it's just a good size. Uh, I would say... In between the paths, if you've got multiple raised beds, put some weed fabric down between the beds and then put some pea gravel or some pavers, some flagstones, stepping stones, something in there. When it's raining out in the middle of July or August and and you want to run out and get some fresh basil, (laughs) trust me, you'll be thankful that you took the time to put a little, little something to step on. So you don't come back with those garden shoes all muddified. It just keeps you out of all the muck and mire. We just want to run out and pick a tomato and bring it back in for a sandwich or run out and get some summer squash for, you know, that evening's dinner. It's much easier if you've got some, something to step on. School of hard knock is all that is just, uh, it's just experience going, you know, I need to do that. Um, I would also say we're in gopher country. This is especially true for you folks in the valley area. Some of you are like go for heaven. As you're putting your raised bed in, it's an opportunity to put in the bottom before you backfill in that raised bed, put some hardware cloth, a half inch size or minus. They can't get through. Make sure it's galvanized. They can't get through it. It Won't rust out on you, but line the bottom of it to keep the vermin out. Gophers and voles, the little tiny field mice, they like to burrow up underneath Come eat the roots and go pocket gophers love your plants. And so you can really keep the, the, the negative influence of the mammals coming at you from underneath by planting ahead. I actually like to put weed fabric underneath mine 
and line it with a, with a fabric. It just kind of keeps everything intact, keeps everything. I just, this is a permanent garden or it's for the long haul, 10 years plus. Why not take a couple extra steps while you're going through all that labor and spending those garden dollars to set up a, a garden bed? Do it right the first time. You'll really thank yourself later uh, d- down the road. That's just, again, school of hard knocks. Sometimes I've done it with one inch minus chicken wire. I've seen, especially baby gophers, they can go through chicken wire. So go a little, the next size down would be just my advice. Okay. What material to use? Now, I like to use raised, uh, the, the retaining block, concrete products, because it's more fashionable. It's in style right now. Uh, I've used uh, old railroad ties. I do find there's a, at the edges, it does affect how plants grow. And creosote, they, they inject so much creosote in those railroad ties. I really don't want that getting into the soil of things I'm going to eat. I mean, a flower bed probably don't care as much. But if I've got pets and dogs and I'm going to eat the stuff, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I don't like that pecky cedar. That's another one you'll see often. It's very inexpensive, but it rots out within, gosh, five years. You're replacing it all. That's no good. I want this to be done 10, 15 years down the road. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to worry about a wall coming down. Uh, I have seen two by eights and that kind of stuff. Again, it rots out. You can use uh, uh, spruce and redwood, which are really expensive now. But I find the, the retaining block is it's quite nice and it's permanent and it looks good. And it's, you can sit on them in the edge and you don't have to worry about it falling down. It's just comfortable. It's a good way to go. That's just, Okay, that's the different kinds of materials. The soil, what do you fill the thing up with? Here's the big mistake. A lot of folks, they take the soil from around their yard and chuck it, fill it back in. Now, let's step back and think this through. Why would you do that? You just went through all this work to get away from the native soil. Why would you fill it up with, with native soil? I, just, I scratch my head every time I hear that. I just want to slap, slap some people. You want to take a good potting soil, fill it up with that. Now, your soil yards, they'll have a gardener's mix. Basically, it's silt they've dug out of a stock tank or a lake and backfilled with some like wood chips. It's still too thick. I, I, you, you, the top layer, at least, you want to have to be potting soil. I would say go to your nursery and get a potting soil, actual mix. We've got it in big commercial grade tubs. I mean, huge landscaper size bags, like a yard and a half. It'll fill up two or three of those at a shot. Fill it up with that. You'll find that growers mix. Your plants will take much better because the soil is lighter. It'll root faster. You're going to get better production if you put potting soil, at least in the upper layers of that. That's one. Check your local garden centers. They can, they can walk you through that process a little easier, but be careful of what you're putting in there because it can turn rock hard on you if you put the wrong thing in or it stays too moist, doesn't drain enough, doesn't filter fast enough, doesn't perk. So that's why you're trying to avoid that native soil because you have those issues. The last thing you want to do is fill it up and, and have the same problems you had before. It looks good, but doesn't grow anything any better. Okay, tip for that segment. Be right back with more tips, tricks, and local advice. You're listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, the owner of Waters Garden Center. He can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center, located in Prescott, 1815 Iron Springs Road. Thanks for tuning in to The Mountain Gardener. Wondering why my garden looks amazing? Well, that's personal. The personal garden shopper service at Waters Garden Center, that is. Before talking with my personal shopper, I had no idea which plants would be best for me. But now my garden is bursting with flowers and buzzing with hummingbirds. Just go to watersgardencenter.com, click on Shop, and choose Personal Garden Shopper. A Waters Garden expert will pick the perfect plants for you, personally. The Personal Garden Shopper, only at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Hi, Lisa with the Plants of the Week and our single blue pinion pine. This new blue variety lends to a tidy appearance in a bold, tough tree. Highly desirable for its edible pine nuts. So eat up. Let it grow wild. Or this 10-foot tree can be shaped for the holidays. These perfectly formed trees are just $85 and only found at Waters Garden Center, 
1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Where people who love native pines and pine nuts, they love to shop. You've tuned in to The Mountain Gardener with local garden expert Ken Lane. Join him each week as he answers timely garden questions that are sure to make a difference in your gardens. Now welcome your host, Ken Lane. It is just amazing how fast an hour's garden show goes every week. I'm just, I wish I had the outline that I have for the show. I just don't have, there's more content, there's more information. But that'll leave you, yeah, you just have to come back next week or check the podcast, leave it on your list, subscribe so you're notified. Uh, and then we're always just here for you. If we touched on something and didn't and it struck a chord, you want to know more? We've got time this time of year to sit down with you and just, just go over it more, show you the products, walk you through the plants. So we've got a garden class this Saturday, how to do wildflowers. If you want to touch and feel and hang out with other really cool people that love funky hats and great gloves called gardeners, come hang out with us. They're from 9.30 to 10.30 every Saturday. Uh, next week, it's on soil prep. So you you should feel the pressure right now to get your soils ready. Get the manures in there. Turn them. Get rid of last year's plants. You really want to get that soil prepped so it's got time to kind of percolate and settle before you, before you start planting uh, in March. And so you get those ready. You get the fertilizer. You get the gypsums. You get all. We're going into detail next Saturday. Then it's fruit trees. Then it's gardening for, for newcomers. The, the trees are in. So fruit trees, we had some peaches show up, apples show up this week. So it starts some, some berries. They're still dormant. They don't have fruit on them, obviously. They're dormant. They're, they're, they're deciduous. That is, they lose their, their leaves in the winter so that they can rest, re, revigorate, and then come back next, usually April, May, June. They start to bloom and start to set fruit, and they just go through that entire sequence Every week right now, we've got new trees coming in, new shrubs. This week, it was the fruit trees, aspens, maples, birch were in, uh, a few more evergreens. The manzanita came in this week, so we had a couple hundred, maybe more. It's a lot of manzanita showed up, four different varieties. So things are starting to happen. And as soon, if, if you're in an area where you're tuned in and, and you can actually work your soil, you can start planting. The only thing that's holding you back is can you find the plant you want? So lilacs are coming in, I think, on Tuesday of next week or this coming week. So or Wednesday, something like that. Any more with trucking, you just never quite know when they're going to show up. Uh, but I know they're loaded and they're rolling this way. So it's starting to happen. It comes down to you can plant when you can find the plant. And when you find the plant, I would suggest do not wait. We, the, the, at the grower level, we're running out of plastic containers to hold these plants in. Anyway, I don't mean to go deep into that, sharing the, the woes at the grower's level, but it's gonna. this is an interesting season that we live in. So going back to garden classes, we want you to be successful. Take a look at watersgardencenter.com. There's a button at the bottom that says classes. Oh, they're all free. They're always on Saturdays at 9.30. But between next week and now, just, we hang out here at Waters Garden Center. So we're here on the floor. You can come talk to us. We'll answer questions if we didn't uh, cover the topic correctly for you. Love talking to fans of the show. As the days get longer and brighter, houseplants can struggle and scorch. But we have the solution. At Waters, we've organized our houseplants from A to Z. For the brightest of sunny locations, many even bloom with experts that know plants and how to make them grow. Shipments of the freshest houseplants in town have just arrived from A to Z and ready for a bright new home. Waters Garden Center, where people who love bright green houseplants, they love to shop, found in Prescott. If you want a more fruitful garden, increase success in your landscape that just feels better, then tune in every week to The Mountain Gardener. Years of tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts are guaranteed to make your gardens nicer than ever. Listen to this podcast or read Ken's weekly garden column by visiting watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Thanks for tuning in.